initiating this whole idea and you know putting in so much effort vignan and sandeep and uh, thanks for all the cns lab members uh, for joining in uh, thanks to the alumni right for joining for the first time it was a great opportunity because of the online uh, you know uh, meeting technologies and also thanks to covid you know this became possible so initially we wanted this to be like a small in you know, a lab meeting because that's what it was uh, last time when we first had done it then uh, this year because of covid uh, you know it was disrupted initially we couldn't have it originally wanted to have it in april we couldn't have it uh, so then we thought let's have it in august maybe on 15th because it's a good day then since anyway it's going to be online so let us uh, have alumni also join the meeting uh, then we thought okay since alumni will be joining may as well open it up to the general an audience and involve more people and you know that way you can connect with people explore collaborations and so on and so so that was the background behind uh, this meeting um so i don't know uh, so the lab has changed a lot uh, over the last few years and for alumni uh, a lot of you guys are still you know following up and you're still in touch with us uh, but a lot of things have changed in the last few years uh, so i'll take quickly take stock of uh, what has happened in the last few years and what is going on right now and what are the plans uh, for the near future and even for the long term so as you know one of the key principles uh, of the lab uh, is uh, to use simplified brain models to explain brain function and over the years we have found that the simplified brain models can be very powerful they have a very a wide explanatory power and they can explain a wide variety of phenomena for a given brain structure and uh, so with that uh, it's it, they, they seem to have even the potential to develop uh, good uh, practical applications both in medicine and uh, in engineering so uh, the goal of the lab right now because it has evolved over the years uh, because we didn't have this kind of clarity in the beginning uh, but right now the goal is to develop a simplified model of the whole brain and use it to develop applications in medicine and engineering and this simplified model uh, we have made this kind of a cartoon picture of the uh, whole brain model uh we call it the meso brain and it's not a new term uh, people like uh, walter freeman at berkeley have been talking about the mesoscopic scale and you know the, so this was come from that the basic idea of this philosophy is uh, if you don't go too deep but to to very small scales like in you know single neurons and molecules and stuff like that or if you don't go to, to very high scales like behavior and large scale systems uh but maybe stick with the pools of neurons neuro ensembles right a new set of laws will emerge and they can be quite universal so this is basically the meso brain you know philosophy or mesoscopic uh, philosophy so based on that uh, we thought we'll create maybe a reduced brain model it may, it may not have 100 billion neurons or even uh, to be more accurate 86 billion neurons it will probably have only 10 million neurons so it's a great reduction in size but uh, it will have all the main components of the mammalian brain so for example in this cartoon picture you, know, you can see that on the right you have the sensory hierarchies of speech to sound and you know uh, sorry uh, vision a sound and touch and then if you climb up a little bit uh, you have language and space then on the output side you have uh, three motor hierarchies uh, the motor that skeletal musculoskeletal system in general then the speech output and eye control eye movement control between the two you have this uh, large decision making regions of the prefrontal cortex then from there you have three major loops uh, consisting of cerebellum basal ganglia and hippocampus so these are this is kind of like a cartoon picture of the mammalian brain if you can create this let us understand the basic theory of each of the main structures and can uh, create this i think that will have a lot of applications both in medicine and engineering so this is where the lab is heading right now <coughs> so in order, in order to facilitate that kind of a construction right uh, we thought obviously to take on the whole brain model uh, straight away would be quite impractical and quite difficult so we thought let's work on different components and then at some future point we can assemble all this into the uh, grand structure so uh, so we have divided the lab into teams so this team structure also is something that has come about uh, more recently it has come as an evolution but we kind of formalized it more uh, over the last few years so you have the stroke team uh, which is looking at uh, computational models for stroke rehabilitation then basal ganglia team has been the oldest and that our main work uh, began with basal ganglia then spatial navigation team then uh, neural oscillators team uh, neurovascular coupling uh, neurovascular team deep vision then right. so so these are some of the main teams and we also have bharati and we have some work going on on uh, modeling memory and things like that 
So these are some of our alumni. Uh, so we have uh, done PhDs here, or masters, or you know, they were like project associates, and uh, now gone out and did sometimes further studies, and then you know, you know doing postdoc uh, in various places, uh, in, you know, NIH and UCSD, and UCSF, and you know, even Cambridge, etc. So this research monograph has come out of our Basil Ganglia work. Uh, this came a couple of years ago, and it was basically all the lab members have contributed chapters. All right, in this work, it mo mostly summarizes our work in Basil Ganglia model. Then the area of education. Uh, so we have this uh, book come out of the lab called Demystifying the Brain. Uh, so the objective of this book is to popularize neuroscience among uh, both engineers and biologists. Uh, engineers, because you know, engineers can be uh, likely to be put off by all the biological jargon. So, how do you explain uh, brain function principles, right? To an, in, in a way that engineer will appreciate it. Uh, the other community is uh, for biologists. You know, how do you how do you convey the uh, modern perspective of brain function, right? In which is in computational terms, right? To a biologist without using uh, mathematical equations. That was the objective of the book, and there's also a video uh, lecture based uh, NPTEL course. Right, so it's a short one month course, which is also based on the book. So, here are some of our collaborators uh, national, international. Uh, national, there are uh, some within IITM, some uh, one uh, outside, and uh, international, we have uh, several people. Uh, for example, Viganga Sur is also a chair professor of the Center for uh, Computational Brain Research in IITM. And then we have you know, several other, you know, all these my colleagues and good friends in uh, various universities. Then from industry, we have Continental uh, Automotive uh, and uh, Tata TCS, Tata Consultancies. So we changed the organization structure of the lab a little bit. Uh, so we have now like well-defined teams and with team leaders uh, and, and so on and so forth. And there's a lot of uh, flexibility given to the teams for expansion. They can like, recruit people. Uh, they have a strong say in recruitment and uh, uh, so, and even choice of problems and they can, you know, Find new avenues for the the overall scope of a given team is 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 fixed, but within that they are free to choose different topics and such for topics and things like that. So we also do a lot of uh, you know we study self help self help literature and you know motivation literature management literature to improve efficiency in what we do and you know uh, so this is also a new thing that has happened in the lab over the last few years. So you can see that uh, you know, we are a happy lot. Uh, right. Uh, this was a picture from the last year's uh, annual day. So the vision is basically, as uh, as you probably most of you know, right, is that in neuroscience right now, uh, there's huge amount of activity going on all over the world in lots of labs, and a huge amount of funds are also being pumped into this research. But uh, typically, what's happening is there's a lot of uh, data that's being generated in uh, various brain systems at various scales, like molecular, cellular, and systems and behavior. But the but the corresponding or uh, commensurate uh, developments in theory seem to be seems to be somewhat weak. I mean, there is obviously a lot of theory, a lot of computational theory, a lot of mathematical theory. Because if you go to a conference like CNS, a computational neuroscience conference, right? It is you know, it's explosive. It's ex expanding every year. But very often one finds that uh, it's a lot of uh, you know co-fitting type models, right? A model which will explain that phenomenon and pretty much nothing else. So and uh, so, a lot of people are expressing uh, some level of uh, some kind of disappointment, right? That uh, there's a need for change. There's a need for some kind of a more fundamental rethinking uh, of the way we do uh, brain theory, right? Uh, for example, uh, V.S. Ramchandran uh, at UCS he says that we are at the paradise stage in neuroscience. That is, we have a lot of empirical results, a lot of simple uh, profiting type mathematical uh, equations, but we don't have deep encompassing theories like, you know, for example, in physics. You have you know the Newton's laws or Lagrangian dynamics or you know Maxwell equations. These kind of a very un encompassing, you know, comprehensive, you know, integrative uh, theories, right? Mathematical and computation theories. Uh, we really don't have them in neuroscience as of now. But uh, a lot of people are expressing the need that uh, they must be there. And one reason, perhaps, things are the way they are is because you know brain is after all a biological system, and biological systems are very complex, obviously, and uh, so there's a, there's a reigning uh, principle of reductionism right everywhere in biology. That is, you need to explain all phenomena in terms of the lowest, uh, smallest constructs in terms of where in the, in the brain that is, in terms of neurons and molecules. 
So, uh, but from an engineering point of view, if you look at the principle, it's futile because it's you don't have to do it in that way, right? For example, if you look at the an aircraft wing, if you want to study the stresses and the pressures around the aircraft wing, you don't have to model the wind flow uh, using multiple multiple dynamics simulations, right? We use the Navier-Stokes equation. We invoke this abstraction called fluid, and uh, the equation is pretty accurate, and uh, you, know, you, can explain, you can apply it in a wide variety of uh, situations. So that will do the job, right? You don't have to obsess over molecules. So similarly, so the thing is, uh, if you hit upon the right level of abstraction, right? We have seen repeatedly in physics and engineering that uh, that whole phenomena, whole domain, simply you know, can be comes into your mastery. You can master it, right? So why is it different in case of neuroscience? So because of this kind of a lopsided, uh, you know, because of this uh, insistence on you know explaining everything in terms of smallest constraints. You very often have see a kind of a lopsided development in neuroscience. There's a lot of understanding and knowledge at, uh, uh, say, single cell and molecular level, right? How do ion channels work? How do receptors work? And things like that. Or, but when it comes to large scale systems, at systems level, uh, things are a bit vague. There's no consensus. I mean, there's no single theory which says this is what hippocampus does, or this is what cerebellum does, or basal ganglia, for that matter. So the lots of schools of thought, lots of camps, and each camp tries to look at that system and describe that system in a, in a, in a peculiar angle, right on and on, decade after decade, without any consensus. So, and, and because of, for that reason, you also have, uh, you don't have good theories of uh, multifactorial diseases or complex diseases like bipolar disorder or schizophrenia and so on. So there's a need to develop simplified models and embodying the right abstraction, just like what we do in uh, physics and engineering. If we do that, uh, you know, I think we can have a lot of applications and a lot of explanatory power, right? So I'll just quickly highlight some of the work we have done in the lab in all these uh, team areas, uh, starting with basal ganglia. So obviously this is not a tech talk. I won't go very deep into it. We don't, we don't have time for all that. Uh, but uh, you can have a lot of posters uh, today and tomorrow and you can look at, uh, get all these details, the lowdown, right, on all these topics. And so if we start with the classical view of basal ganglia, so we look at, uh, so, you know, basal ganglia anatomy is uh, divided into the direct pathway and indirect pathway. The direct pathway consisting of the cortical inputs going to striatum. And from striatum, it goes to GPI or SNR and, and then where thalamus, the outputs return back to cortex. Then there is a longer pathway, the indirect pathway, which consists of uh, GPE and STN and STN projects to GPI, and then it joins the direct pathway. So SNC, the substantial negative pass compactor, projects to striatum and reduces dopamine. And if the striatal dopamine levels are high, the direct pathway is selected, which facilitates movement, and therefore it's called a go pathway. And if striatal dopamine levels are low, then the no-go pathway is selected, and therefore it inhibits movement. So basal ganglia function is, is described traditionally in terms of some kind of a push-pull effect right on movement, which is tuned by basal by dopamine. So if you see like uh, you know old earliest papers by Albin and uh, Young and DeLong and all these people, you will find this kind of a picture. Even Candle's chapter on basal ganglia gives you this kind of a picture. But uh, the, with all the developments in reinforcement learning and the connection between dopamine signals and the TD error uh, in reinforcement learning. A lot of new modeling has happened, and we have also uh, taken a start of, started that line of work uh, way back in about 2005, 2006. And we kind of propose that uh, so the, so the no-go pathway is not just a no-go pathway, but also does exploration uh, by virtue of the complex dynamics that you find in STNGP glue, right, in the normal brain, and which and the, the dynamic complex is lost under PD conditions, under pathological conditions. Right, and loss of dynamics, uh, like dynamic complex in, in, in pathological conditions, is quite often seen in the in brain. Right, so, so this is another example of that. So, uh, so this is the kind of picture we proposed, and we justified it from experimental data, and we also did a lot of modeling to show that. And uh, so, this idea we developed uh, didn't happen overnight. Developed over a series of, uh, for example, the earliest work was by Sridhar Devarajan, right on his DDP project. So Sridhar is at uh, Neuroscience Center in. ISA right now, and then two master's projects, uh, Ganga, that who is in you know is visit Switzerland in mind maze, uh, and uh, and then Denny Joseph, I can get a picture, right? Uh, then followed by a series of PhD theses by Pragati and Alekia and Vignesh, and you will see their posters today. You know, I think right in the next session or the subsequent sessions. 
uh, and also an, another uh, uh, Ankur Gupta, right? And through a series of these projects, we developed this theory and we will explain a wide variety of motor functions of basal ganglia, right? Including handwriting, reaching movements, and gait, and uh, disc based station making, right? Which where we make connection with uh, serotonin, uh, which is Prakriti's thesis work, and then position grip and bird song. Deep brain stimulation, Oleki like worked on this, and Sakar generation, spatial navigation. So that was what has resulted in this book. Uh, then uh, after this book, uh, so up to that point, we, we were asking this question, that is, uh, if for whatever reason, there is loss of cells in uh, substance nigra, so there is reduction in dopamine. So what are the consequences of that? Why do you see all these symptoms in PD because of loss of cells in SNC? So that was the question that we addressed until this point. But after the book, uh, you know, when Vignan came in, we thought we'll ask a more, uh, and go to next level and ask a deeper question. Why do these cells die in the first place? Because when in PD, when you see this uh, loss of cells in SNC, they just call it idiopathic. We don't understand why it happens. We don't know the reason. But uh, so we looked around and there, there were a couple of interesting hypotheses and some experimental evidence, which suggests that uh, you know, the degeneration that you see in PD is because of metabolic deficiency. So, uh, so Vignan set out to explore this uh, in quite detail using very detailed computation models. And his simulations have shown that uh, uh, there is, uh, this is true and uh, there is because of metabolic deficiency, you see the symptoms and changes that you see in PD, right, at the molecular and cellular and systems level. So he just completed a thesis, you know, he got his doctorate uh, just recently uh, on this work. So the, the long-term plan for uh, basal ganglia team is uh, to, uh, to, to, to convert the testing process um, and make it more rigorous and more quantitative. So suppose when a patient comes in and you, you uh, take uh, speech and handwriting and you know, decision making data and gate data and put all this data in a computation model, get model parameters, uh, you know, make it patient specific, models patient specific, and then, then simulate the treatment on the model and then give it to the real patient. So Sandeep is working on some aspects of this as far as thesis now. So then the second team is, uh, you know, for campus and spatial uh, navigation. So we did some work on spatial, spatial cells for campus. So as you know that, uh, you know, in the 1971, John O'Keefe and colleagues have discovered these cells called place cells, which fire whenever the animal is at a certain location, right, uh, in, the, in the environment. In 2005, that's much more recently, uh, the Moser couple, Maybrick Moser and Edward Moser have found these other kinds of cells uh, which uh, which fire at multiple locations, and all these locations form some kind of a regular uh, periodic grid, which is very often a hexagonal grid. So these two uh, lines of work uh, was awarded Nobel, Nobel Prize in 2014. So that made this uh, whole area very exciting, and a lot of people have jumped in and you know started working on this. So this uh, video shows uh, uh, the concept of place cells. So there's an electrode hooked up inside the animal's hippocampus, specifically the CA1 area. So whenever it goes to that kind of a top left part of the box, right, this cell is firing. Those red dots indicate the firing events uh, of this cell. So we began a uh, line of modeling on, of the hippocampal spatial cells. Uh, you know, early initial model was developed by Ignatius and Karthik. And uh, so uh, and this is this network has you know it's uh, some of the standard uh, neural network you know, learning theory elements. Uh, but one new thing that we did in this model is that the velocity is used to frequency modulate a bunch of oscillators. That was the main uh, main idea in this uh, model. And after that, you have you do PCA and all that. And we found uh, standard grid cells uh, with not only hexagonal, but you know square grid cells and you know, octagonal grid cells and so on and so forth. Uh, so next, Karthik has developed it further and uh, applied it to data from bats. Right, we got this data from uh, Michael Yatsev at UC Berkeley. And bats also have place cells, uh, and these are isotropic. So in simulations, uh, you know, we found that uh, you know, there are also place cells in simulations. In addition to plane cells, place cells, Karthik also found a new class of cells called plane cells, right, which fire whenever the animal crosses a certain plane embedded in the 3D space. And also uh, another kind of cells called stack cells, right, uh, which fire whenever the animal crosses not just one plane, but a multiple set of planes. Now, or a stack of planes, so you call it the stack cell. So at the time of the publication of the paper, which is published in Nature Communications, uh, we knew only place cells, but there was, we didn't know 
uh, if plain cells existed but kartik after uh, finishing his phd joined yard cells lab and and uh, dug up the old data from yard cells lab and uh, actually found that there are these things called plain cells but we are still looking for evidence for the stack cells so uh, so then we applied uh, the same line of models uh, to uh, you know, grid cells found in saccharides so there's a nature paper which found that the grid cells corresponding to saccharidic moments so when, when an animal scans an image right uh, on that image space there are also grid cells again found in interrenal cortex so we extended the previous models to this and also found uh, similar grid cells so then uh, samyukta and rukmini and others have Applied these kinds of models to to study the effect of environment, environmental geometry right on the development of uh, grid cell patterns. Then currently Azra uh, is working on his team leader for uh, spatial navigation is working on uh, and applying to the two D navigation models for a variety of experimental studies like you know, for example one from Mayank Mehta's group in UCLA right where they look at uh, data from a rat navigating a triangular maze in a virtual reality setting. <coughs> there's this other study where the rat uh, navigates from among multiple compartments of a more complex environment so then uh, harsha right who's a dual who's a dual degree student from chemical engineering along with azra and uh, with the uh, inputs and guidance from uh, uh, the string theorist uh, and ayan mukherji from physics department right he is uh, looked at the 3d navigation and found that Uh, so th- the some of the weight factors that evolve right out out of this learning are closely related to uh, spherical harmonics right now so spherical harmonics is something that you find in is a in, in maths right in solutions of laplace equation in in spherical coordinates now it's uh, this suggestion first came with from ayan mukherjee right and it's uh, very fascinating that uh, how you would find uh, such a you know sophisticated mathematical uh, idea showing up in you know 3d navigation of uh, you know animals so next uh, we look we are currently we also working on a project a large funded project on stroke rehabilitation so this is funded by tcs uh, you know partly and uh, by mhrd and icmr partly right and we have other uh, collaborators in this uh, dr bapi raju from tripet hyderabad and our uh, cg tesh from nimhans and dr keshav das and dr sailaja from sri chitra so you know stroke is a big uh, you know a big killer and right? so second most frequent of frequent cause of death after coronary artery disease and uh, so in this uh, project we are combining several technologies computation modeling neuro imaging and virtual reality gaming uh, so uh, and this is a stroke team is a pretty large and uh, kind of a uh, very spirited and bubbly team consisting of you know, sundari and anurag joined recently So Ashwin, Shreya, Jyoti, and uh, Sayan and uh, Divya. So we have looked at the computation model. This was inspired by the previous uh, basal area model. We made it a bilateral model corresponding to, to the two hemispheres, which are coupled by parallel connections. And uh, so what the model has shown is that you know the you know the purpose of the model is to look at uh, which stroke rehabilitation protocol is the best. because there are several protocols that are in the in circulation and something like for example by manual reaching so you have to use both hands together as opposed to a constant constant induced movement therapy which says that you have to tie up the good hand the intact hand and let the patient only work with the affected hand as much as possible so now both these uh, theories are same almost you know mutually contradictory so it's almost like a religion you know to decide which uh, protocol is is better so what the model has suggested is that under small lesion conditions the bimanual is better than cmt and when the lesion size is larger cmt is better than bimanual so this work was published in scientific reports last year so now we are extending that to more deep learning type simpler computation models and uh, so a lot of work is going on in that i think you will find some data in the posters we also are developing uh, virtual reality based gaming you know based on kinect and then you know, irs and things like that so there are, again uh, we develop already several games so we are also developing a kitchen game a gardening game like a tennis game a rangoli game as so divya is developing a very large uh, rangoli game because it has some indian uh, kind of a connotation then the uh, neural oscillation steam uh, so we began modeling neural oscillations uh, just over the last a couple of uh, 
years. So the thing is, uh, the motivation for this is as follows. Uh, so if you look at the neural code, the, the most vexing question of what is the correct neural code, the two theories in, in currently you know, being recognized, one is a red-coded neuron and the other is spiking neuron. So in red-coded neuron, the theory believes that you know, what is important is the firing rate of the neuron. In the spike code, uh, it is believed that what is important is the spike timing. Okay, so, but there's a the third school of thought which says that uh, the basic computation unit of the brain is not the single neuron, but a neural ensemble. And if you, if you believe that, if you accept that, then the, uh, the total activity or uh, average ac activity of this collective uh, will not be a bunch of spikes, but uh, it will be a, a smoother signal, right? The kind of signal that you, that you uh, encounter in signal processing or, or in electrical engineering. Right, so the tools to describe such signals will be quite different from the tools that you use for analysis of spikes. So with that motivation, we started looking at nonlinear oscillators, limit cycle oscillators, uh, to model the activities of uh, neural ensembles. So Deepayan is a team leader for this team, and you know, Suri Kiran, uh, Shreyas has joined recently, then Ashit did his uh, dual degree project on this. So we, we began our work with the half oscillator, which is the simplest kind of uh, you know, limit, limit cycle oscillator. But uh, one special thing that we have done is we started studying it in the complex domain. Instead of looking at it as two variables, X and Y, you, know, we can, you can also write uh, half oscillator as a, in terms of complex variables, Z. And uh, so that's also well known, but what uh, we have, what we propose, a new thing that we have proposed is that when you couple two oscillators, we couple them using what we call a power coupling. That is raise the so power of uh, raise each variable. So if you cut in two oscillators, Z1 and Z2, when Z1 sends its signal out to Z2, right, raise it to the power uh, which is based on the ratio of the frequencies, right. And uh, so because of that, what happens is when Z1, which is at frequency omega one, Z2 is at frequency omega two, when Z1 sends a signal out to Z2, right, uh, it, this frequency gets transformed at the synapse. And they say the low frequency of Z1 becomes high frequency of Z2. So the, the neuron 2 will only get to hear the high frequency signal, which is its own intrinsic frequency. Similarly, when neuron 2 talks to neuron uh, 1, right, neuron 1 gets to hear only the, the low frequency signal, which is equal to its own intrinsic frequency. So because of that, you, know, you get immense uh, mathematical uh, conveniences. And uh, based on that, we proposed a network and so we are able to fit uh, you know, EEG data, multi-channel EEG data using this network, uh, which is currently under review in a, at a journal. So then uh, Deepan is looking at uh, modeling locomotor rhythms, right? Locomotor rhythms for especially for quadrupeds and even multipeds are quite complex and very interesting. A lot of work has been done. So we have our network can be trained to you know, learn any of these uh, complex locomotor rhythms. So we are right now along with Shreyas, we are trying to put this on a walking robo and uh, right and control its uh, its movement so it looks something like this okay this is still you know this is going on so next uh, i'll come to deep vision team so we have been modeling vision for some time and uh, so one of the first studies in that area is uh, the phd work of ryan phillips so ryan started modeling the retinotopic map so as you know that you know, in retina the fovea has highest uh, density of receptors and so when it is mapped onto the visual cortex Right, a big area is allotted to the foveal area of the retina. But it's not simply a one-to-one -one mapping, a simplistic one-to-one -one mapping. Uh, so there's a very uh, deep uh, distortion that, uh, that this mapping undergoes when you map from retina to, to V1. And that is uh, quite accurately uh, explained or fitted using the complex uh, log function, uh, right? Uh, but it's not, it's very you know, counterintuitive. I mean, why would brain come up with uh, this kind of weird function in the complex domain, complex variable domain? So Ryan started looking at why this kind of a map can, uh, you know, how it can develop. And he, he showed a learning model, right, uh, that, uh, that developed this kind of a map. Then uh, subsequently, uh, Anila, uh, you know, right now is, is, is doing PhD in my lab. Uh, she started studying the problems related to processing visual motion. So specifically, she looked at uh, the aperture problem in, in visual motion. So in this problem, if you have a large object um, with many edges, and if it is, it's a moving object, so each edge moves it's in its own different direction, whereas the overall direction of motion of the object will be something else. So 
so the question is how do you integrate the motion of the edge in where in a different of different directions of motion of different edges and infer the di overall direction of motion of the ob object so uh, this is called aperture problem and anila has proposed a kind of two layer uh, archetypical network model for uh, for processing this because uh, it is no it is uh, known that we when uh, process the motion of the edges that is you know what is called the component motion and uh, mt mst right uh, higher up process uh, the motion of the overall object uh, overall motion of the object so in anilas model you know she sees this kind of a hierarchy emerging naturally and lower layer looks at the component motion and the higher layer looks at this overall motion or pattern motion so subsequently we looked at uh, another problem in vision but this is more in applied domain uh, so this is uh, we got this is out of come out of project with uh, continental automotive <coughs> they sponsored a project with us so here the problem is to find targets uh, in a road video so this is a deep learning type uh, architecture uh, based on reinforcement learning so the in this picture you see how in the road signs are captured uh, by the algorithm uh, this work was done by neeraj and shweta and a few others so shweta subsequently started working on a more general class of attention search problems so in the attention search there is a whole class of problems and shweta is trying to develop a, a general architecture which can you know take on all these different class of problems as you know uh, as a special cases right so for example if you are recognizing a missed uh, character right uh, using a small attention window which cannot see the entire character in one go but you have to jump over the character and make multiple saccades correct right? integrate all the information to identify the character right that, that's one problem she is looking at she got very good results and she has a poster on that you can look at that then let me come to neurovascular coupling uh, so this has been a very very exciting area in our lab we've been working on this for almost 10 years now uh, one question we have coming out of this uh, line of activity is uh, do cerebral vessels compute do blood vessels small vessels in the brain do they also participate in computation in the brain so in the brain if you look at the interaction between neurons and blood vessels <clears throat> so neural neurons which are active uh, send out vasodilators which act on uh, So first of all, uh, you know, uh, directly they can act directly on blood vessels and dilate them. Or uh, the neurotransmitters released by neurons can act on astrocytes. The astrocytes uh, release vasodilators, right, which uh, dilate the vessels, right. And so this is called neurovascular coupling. And there is a tendency to describe this as some kind of a unidirectional influence, right, emanating from neurons and terminating in vessels. But we know that uh, it's not a unidirectional influence because there's a loop, there's a feedback from vessels to neurons. Because when vessels dilate, they release glucose and oxygen, which is picked up by uh, astrocytes, and glucose is converted to lactate by astrocytes, and lactate is released into the neurons. So there's a feedback loop. The question is, how significant is this feedback loop? Right. That is, if you call neural activity information processing, why can't you call uh, vascular activity also information processing? so we began, began thinking on these lines uh, way back in a 2010 paper uh, which was uh, which has come out as a undergrad product of uh, in a project of rohit uh, so in this in this project we propose a three layer network so you have neurons and glia and blood vessels right and basic idea is neurons send out signals to glia and send glia sends signals to vessels vessels dilate or get activated then vessels release something which is you can call it energy which is glucose and uh, glia pick it up and release something else which you can think of as lactate which is picked up by neurons so now the thing is neurons have a demand pattern the different neurons have different energy demand pattern and the the release pattern of energy should be also uh, you know should correspond to tightly with the demand pattern so demand and supply should uh, should match so we call this energy matching principle so if you accept this principle then you, there are a lot of mathematical and biological consequences to this and that's what this model explores Uh, and the, and uh, in fact a uh, lot of them are still not yet proven uh, so one of the things that came out of this is that glial cells also should have tuned responses for example they should be able to uh, respond to tuned uh, oriented bars right and uh, in fact uh, that evidence already has come uh, from rugan kasur's lab schumer et al it's a science paper from i think 2008 uh, then but we also propose that even blood vessels should have tuned responses that evidence has come only a couple of years ago from prakash kara's lab uh, who is now in minnesota 
so uh, and then uh, so that was a slightly simplified model so then bunkim sort developed a more detailed model a very biophysically very involved model uh, of uh, neuron associated and visceral interaction so then karishma for her master's thesis uh, has started with a more biophysical model uh, right with the uh, five variables uh, and then systematically reduced that to more abstract models so three variables and two variables and basically has uh, shown that the effect of atp right or energy uh, released into a neuron basically controls its threshold of firing right so so that that gives a basis to construct more abstract models right and that which is what uh, ryan and karishma have explored in their very fascinating model published in 2016 so in this model there's a neural network there's a vascular network and a neuromodulator system all three coupled in a loop and so we don't distinguish between vessels and neurons they're all doing information processing of different kinds right and then connected in a loop uh, so this is a very fascinating uh, piece of work and uh, then more recently badra is working on this for her phd work and uh, she and she has done a couple of other studies but i'll mention this latest one which is working on uh, we call this the artificial neurovascular networks just like you know artificial neural networks artificial immune system this is a very abstract formulation of neurovascular coupling so in this uh, line of models you have a deep network or a neural network Uh, which is uh, fed by a vascular network right and neurons are based on their function demand for energy and vessels uh, you know feed or supply that energy the thing is just like neurons learn to you know meet certain output criteria the vessel network the vascular network also learns to meet the demand patterns of the neural network so you have two learning systems you know coupled and working together a lot of interesting consequences and phenomena that are coming out Uh, they have a couple of posters in the in the conference and you know you can take a look at them so finally we have uh, you know on the more artificial modeling uh, domain we developed something called flip flop neural networks uh, a few years ago this was a ddp work of uh, pavan hola the basic idea behind this is uh, as follows so if you look at uh, neural networks like you know static networks like cnn and if you go to rnns right like lstm So LSTM is a major workhorse of uh, you know temporal processing networks right now. But if you look at uh, electrical engineering systems, so because both Pawan and myself we are we have basic training in electrical engineering. So if you look at static logical uh, systems like in you know, Boolean networks, uh, the basic unit is a logic gate. And if you go to sequential networks, the basic basic unit is a flip flop. So then we said why not uh, develop a so called flip flop neuron and construct networks out of them. So that's what we have done, and Pawan has shown uh, that such networks can be used to solve a lot of very difficult uh, delay decision making problems. The way the decision is is uh, spread, stretched out over time, over long durations. So more recently, Vignesh and Sujit uh, have extended this model to and applied it to time series prediction, and we got uh, very good results, and it was even beating LSTM on several occasions. So it's a it's a good model, a good contender uh, for sequential processing. Okay, so that's a quick review, and the road ahead uh, is follows. Uh, this is I'm talking about near term, right? One exciting possibility that emerges in the near term, like maybe our last next three five years, is uh, to develop an oscillator theory of the brain. Now, uh, so we are so used to think of brain function in terms of spikes, but it's also possible to think of brains in terms of oscillations. Right? In fact, oscillations were very old, and like way back when Hans Berger has recorded EEG waves from. from brain and we we were talking about brain oscillations and spikes came much later spikes are because spikes are more difficult to record now if you look at people like bazaki they always talking in terms of oscillations and you know, and waves and and if you look at the work of uh, people like uh, walter freeman who is no more with us and I have a great regard for that man uh, he always spoke in terms of you know uh, oscillations and chaos and all that so i feel that, that there is a lot of uh, you know theoretical developments a very rich theoretical developments possible in that area so you can develop theories of oscillations in spatial navigation we have done some of that our theories of oscillation in attention so we are now doing uh, some modeling on those lines oscillations in motor function we have done some work on modeling and handwriting in terms of oscillations oscillation in autonomic control i mean we haven't done anything but you know there's very lot of experimental evidence on those lines oscillations in mood for example the mood oscillations of bipolar disease so we have done some work on that so uh, similarly oscillations of uh, brain disorders so you know in brain disorders loss of complex dynamics right resulting in more oscillate regular oscillations that's a well known feature whether it is 
the synchronized beta oscillations of pd or you know the the oscillations of uh, you know as uh, of, his, of an epileptic seizure you know it's a very well known phenomenon then oscillations in memory oscillations of signal processing and so on and so forth so we can we, it would be nice to develop an integral theory that encompasses all these different brain functions now in the practical domain we want to develop uh, you know a kind of a a search robot called hanu hanu stands for hierarchical adaptive or hierarchical autonomic uh, navigating unit so we can bring together the activities of several teams in creation of this kind of a robot so for example spatial navigation team can figure out the spatial navigation of the robot the oscillator team can figure out how the legs are going to move the attention extension search team can figure out how the camera or the eyes move right uh, then the stroke team also is working on reaching right so you can study if there's any reaching and grasping kind of functions and you know, maybe the stroke team models can be applied to that that problem then we also doing some interesting work with the dr anindita sahu who is a linguist in humanities and uh, we have a joint phd student called krishna so if we make progress in that area we can also maybe make uh, make this uh, robo language enable maybe you can make it understand language instructions verbal instructions so the big picture of uh, where we are going is like this and i would like to develop this large scale brain model and apply it to uh, problems in medicine and engineering in fact i am envisioning some kind of a center maybe i don't know uh, slightly in much longer term uh, in a huge center with maybe a couple of hundred pis right looking at wide variety of applications like you know for example how do you give uh, how do you determine, determine drug dosage for parkinsons how do you determine drug combination right for a given parkinsons patient or in you know, a personal assistant for an alzheimers right which should which run on a mobile right which will help them you know with their which can act like an like a auxiliary unit for their memory loss <coughs> or <coughs> stroke rehabilitation for ptsd and hemi neglect you know for example take a hemi neglect patient how do you help them uh, become aware of the part of the space that they are neglecting which is typically the left side or how do you help people come out of you know start up <coughs> right so you can think of a huge universe of applications right in in neuroscience in rehab and so on similarly on the engineering side you, know, you can you know you can once you have this kind of a large scale model of the brain you can put it in a drone or a robo or a driverless car underwater in autonomous underwater vehicles auvs artificial tutors for you know teaching math arithmetic you know whatever right? so it's i mean i'm really envisioning a kind of a grand center which will where different teams will develop a, applications on different aspects so i'm i'm thinking of neuroscience becoming some kind of engineering domain that is you have all the basic research but thing is if you develop mathematical models the way you do in engineering with the first principles in mind i think they can be very powerful they can be very versatile right and which uh, can be developed into a lot of applications right uh, so so thing is in, in but the only thing is you need to structure the research in certain fashion computational modeling should be the heart and soul of that kind of research and all of the experimental uh, lines of work should feed into the computational model right not of that you know you can create startups nickel applications and so on so let us dream together because neuroscience is a great uh, field it's a very exciting field and uh, uh, so you'll never get tired of it i mean it's almost like i feel it's like a game of the infinite so it's a infinite field especially if you want to make contact with deeper phenomena of mind and consciousness right you cannot keep on obsessing over molecules and neurons and you need to have very different theoretical frameworks and these things are happening right now in, in internationally so i think that kind of shift in focus must take place because if you look at psychiatry you know if you look at some of the masters of you know in psychiatry like you know freud or jung they were talking about very different kinds of concepts for example freud used to talk about you know uh, ego super ego id and libido and all that Now, how do you describe super ego using complex models of today and we, we don't even come close we don't even think on those lines or you know uh, jung talks about collective unconscious right what is collective unconscious it doesn't make any sense from the point of view of contemporary neuroscience but can we look at some of these deeper questions and and uh, you know push for push forward much faster right by developing simplified brain models right and and really uh, you know expand this excitement that's happening in in neuroscience so thank you and uh, so my next job that i'm i'm given is to slightly onerous job of uh, of you know, announcing the best team selected so we have this team selection every year so last year we had it and best selected team won last year 
and uh, this year uh, again I need to announce the best team so I'm going to announce the best three teams and by the way the selection is not done by me at all I have no say in this it is done by the teams themselves so each team selects the top three teams only thing is the restriction is that a team cannot select itself okay so with that uh, now I want to announce uh, the teams the best teams of the 2019-2020 so the third prize goes to Bharati team. Uh, although I never mentioned Bharati in this work, in this uh, presentation, because it's supposed to be a neuroscience uh, presentation, but Bharati is a very important part of what our lab is doing. So Vikram, uh, Vik Vikram Kumar as team leader, he's been doing a fantastic job. I mean, he's running the project uh, you know, almost single-handedly with his energy and motivation. So they also, he also has excellent team members in his uh, team. Uh, Chandrasekhar, who is uh, from IIIT, CCT, who's been helping us a lot with this. Then Ashwin is uh, in, uh, in CNS lab. Vigneshwaran also joined us recently in, as a college associate. Uh, and Ajit uh, was in, in the lab, and then he moved on to Buffalo to do his master's. So all of them are contributing both remotely and, you know, and uh, within the lab. Uh, so congratulations to, you know, to Vikram. The second prize goes to uh, so the best in India team. Uh, there's two team leaders. I keep joking that it's like, you know, in, in Roman civilization, they have, in Roman Empire, they have two consuls, like two bosses. So, it's, so this team has two bosses, uh, Vignan and Sandeep. Uh, they call themselves the best in explorers. The team team members are Srivarsha and Rima and Shubhaniti. They are all from different colleges. Right? So we work extensively with uh, people outside. So the geographical boundaries are no more important for us. But there were, there were a lot more students, but most of them had moved out and finished their projects and moved out. The first prize goes to uh, neural oscillations team. The team leader is Deepa, and, and the oscillator team has expanded a lot uh, over the last year. And uh, the team team members right now are Asit, Surikiran, and Shreyas. And uh, so uh, uh, they are looking at many different aspects uh, of uh, oscillator uh, function. Right, so uh, Jay Hind, let me play the uh, national anthem and uh, we can stop with that. फिल्मी गाने से जुड़े रहने के लिए YouTube ऐप के बेल आइकन को प्रेस करें। जनगणमन अधिनायक जय हिंद भारत भाग्य विधाता पंजाब सिंध गुजरात मराठा राविड पुत्र बंगा विंध्य हिमाचल यमुना गंगा चल जल धितरंगा तव शुभ नामे जागे तव शुभ आशीष मागे गाहे तव जय गाथा जन गण मंगल दायक जय हे भारत भाग्य विधाता जय हे जय हे Hello, Vigyan, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Yeah, so, uh, so I think next event is this uh, post session one, right? Yeah. So, so, uh, so you, you guys can proceed to the posters and you know have a good time. Yeah. So the the links are activated, so you can proceed to the website, and from there you can be read to particular posters. <laughs> 